So uh, as Cam said, my name is Steph Vantoff. I am the member service rep for Northeastern Ontario for the OFA. So I support the farmers and federations across the Northeast with their issues and their um, initiatives and opportunities. Uh, this is a three-year pilot that ends this September, and it's a collaboration between the 10 federations in Northern Ontario and NOFIA. Um, agriculture in the North, and I'm sure we all on this webinar know, uh, it's a really important economic pillar and it's growing. So we see a lot of opportunity and a lot of potential for growth in the sector, uh, partly due to a changing climate, partly due to agri-tech advances that are letting us are opening the viability window for different commodities. And because we actually have affordable and available farmland, which most of this province cannot point to. Um, so there is a lot of really exciting growth or potential for growth in the sector. With that though, compounds the issue of plastic. And I just wanna note here, ag plastics are not an issue specific to the North or the province or the country. This is an issue across the world. And even though agricultural plastic is a small component of total plastic use, it can be very visible. And people at some point will start driving down the roads and asking, you know, what are those cute little marshmallows in the fields and where does that plastic go? And we don't have a great story. So right now, typical end use options, sorry. Typical end use options are burying, burning and landfilling. Again, those are global options, not specific to us, uh, but they're not great for the environment and they aren't super long-term options. But as you can see here, plastic after it's used on farm can be a mess. It can be hard to store, hard to transport, hard to keep clean, just generally hard to manage, uh, which helps explain partly the lack of useful viable options for farmers. So our pilot in a nutshell was to deal with two things. The first was to find recovery options for that plastic, especially given that Cleaning that plastic on farm is a no-go. So we know the plastic will be considered uh, contaminated for lack of a better word with dirt, with feed. And the second option or the second point of the pilot was to figure out how we move that plastic. So although plastic is an issue everywhere in the North, we have a separate issue of we have huge spaces, lots of kilometers for that plastic to travel and fewer farms. So how do we, deal with that plastic in an effective way so it's somewhat uh, less cost prohibitive to move it. And this is how we tackled that issue. So these are the compactors we're using in the pilot. Uh, we have a video on Nofia's website if you'd like to check it out as to how the compactor works. But it's very simple. It's that wooden compactor. It's got a plunger on the top that you use either a tractor spear or an excavator or some other piece of equipment to compact the plastic in that box. And once your bale is done, you pull off the box and finish tying it. So it makes those bales you see on the right, they're about 900 pounds when fully compacted. And they sit on a four by four pallet. If they're properly tied, they can sit like that for a really, really long time. Uh, some of those bales have been there for years and still held their shape if properly compacted. So the compactor itself, the design and the ones we purchased are from Lynn Levitt at UPAC Agri Service. He's been dealing with, uh, he's a bee farmer in the East, but he's been dealing with the recovery of plastic for well over a decade. Uh, and he's been really instrumental in not only getting our pilot off the ground, but also some recovery work happening out West and in Quebec. Uh, so a lot, I would say a lot of the work in Ontario, at least for ag plastic is attributed and because of Lynn uh, and his tireless efforts over the years. So at a very high level, some of the outcomes that we anticipated from the pilot, uh, looking at installing compactors across the north, developing a stewardship program that would include, uh, or was going to include some centralized sites. So this was prior to COVID on paper, the idea for the pilot was that farmers would make their bales at their farms. And then once a year, we would have a site or two sites in each region that they would come and drop their bales off we would do all of the traceability and quality control, and then we would pick those bales up from that site and take them to an end user. Uh, that has changed, and I'll get into the challenges in a bit, but that has changed because of COVID. So it's a little more informal as of right now. Um, and then the other outcomes for the pilot were to gain the data and the information we need. So specifically data around uh, 
the type of, and levels of contamination coming from on farm and if that's acceptable for an end user, depending on what they're making, the finances, so what it's gonna cost to move the type of plastic or the amount of plastic we're dealing with, um, especially if we're going to be figuring out ways to, uh, in the future, if there's some sort of recovery model program, figuring out ways to cover the costs of that program without burdening um, unequitably Northern farmers. And then developing some best management practices for the farmer, for the end user, for stewardship, just in generally. So the pilot so far, um, we have 25 compactors in the north and five in the east. So the five in eastern Ontario are through a collaboration with Lennox and Addington County. And the 25 in the north, the majority of them are on farm. So either a farmer is using them himself or herself, or they're sharing amongst their neighbors, depending on how they get along with their neighbors, how much plastic they produce, things like that. Two of them are mobile compactors. So the Algoma Federation purchased two and they are brought on farm when a farmer has enough plastic to compact into a bale. And then one is with the township of Chisholm at their public works yard. And they have designated days where farmers drop off their plastic and then the public works staff compact those bales. So you have a couple different models of plastic consolidation within the pilot itself. We're doing our bale inventory now, um, but we roughly have so far 100 tons of mixed plastic, and this is mostly heavier, denser plastics. And then we have about 50 tons of single stream, the vast majority bale wraps, so the thinner, less dense plastic. Best practices, and these will be flushed out uh, once we actually do our final reporting in September, but these are some things that we've found helpful so far. For the logistics and for the end user, keeping a bale single stream makes it much, much easier to handle. That said, for some farmers, especially depending on how much plastic you have and how many cows you feed, a mixed bale is the only way it makes sense to have a compactor on farm. So the challenge here will be finding a balance between keeping the end user and logistics side happy by having as many bales single stream while recognizing that some farmers, unless they're gonna take three years to make a bale, some farmers have enough streams of plastic on the farm that they combine uh, their heavier, denser plastics with their lighter plastics. Making it part of your regular routine was another one. Again, your regular routine looks different for every farm, um, but the farmers that found they were doing the most work were the farmers saying Algoma that would pile their plastic up and then once a year compact it. So that's double the work. So if you're putting your, if you're piling the plastic in a storage area somewhere and then dealing with it, or if you're putting it in totes and then dealing with it, you're moving your plastic twice. But if that's the way you prefer to deal with your plastic, that makes sense. But the, the fear or the worry here is that you get overwhelmed by the plastic you have, and then it's just easier to just kind of get rid of it in the old, unenvironmentally friendly ways. The stationary compactor makes a better quality bale. Um, although I will say the, the mobile compactors in Algoma, the bales that are coming out of Algoma are really, really solid looking. They're perfectly compacted. They look really clean. They look like great bales. So it is possible to make a really great bale even if you don't have a compactor on site, but it's really important in that case that the farmer takes the time and the care to do so. So the farmers in Algoma that had piled up their plastic and then made their bales, they made sure that they, they shook out their plastic and they really took the time to make a really great bale, which we appreciate. Um, but I think generally speaking, unless your farmers are committed, having your compactor on farm is still an easier option, recognizing that that doesn't make sense for everyone. And the most important thing and the most obvious thing is to compact it. And we, we cannot stress this enough we recognize that every, every first or second bale will look wonky. It will mushroom out because people underestimate how long they should compact it. Um, but compacting it is key. So you, you throw your plastic in your compactor, you fill it however full you wanna do it. You throw your tractor on it with the plunger, you press it down, the front wheels lift up and then go for lunch. Like go do some chores for the afternoon. The longer you, um, or the, the fuller you make your compactor, the longer you want to leave that tractor on there, but it doesn't hurt to compact a little extra. 
it does matter if you don't come hack it enough, your bail won't be heavy enough and it won't maintain that integrity, that structure, that square, that's really important for shipping. So compacting it is key. And then tying your time, your time, tying your twine as tight as you can to make sure it holds together. So the challenges, our challenges are very specific to COVID. And I think if COVID hadn't have happened, then we might have, well, we would have dealt with other challenges that still exist, but that are smaller in nature. So our challenges right now are just COVID related. The first is the plastic recovery end user. And this exists before and will exist after COVID. The plastic recovery business is a business. So the folks that are building and operating those businesses are looking for profit as most of us are, um, and that's fine. Very much tied to the price of oil and what, you know, what businesses existed last year to recover plastic don't exist today and what exists uh, today may not be here next year and what's not here today may be here next month. Um, but that makes it really hard when you're structuring a stewardship program that is meant to be long-term and that will take a lot of work to bring online. Uh, it makes it really hard if you don't have a committed end user because you don't know then what types of plastic they want. If you can do a single stream or mixed bale, given that uh, mixing your plastic is so easiest for the farmer, how clean that plastic has to be, if there's gonna be issues around moisture or odor. If you don't have any of that known, when the farmer's making the bale because you don't have an end user, um, it makes it really hard once your bales are made to deal with them if they're not proper according to the parameters or the specs the end user needs. In our case, we had an end user that was going to be using pyrolysis to essentially cook the plastic, to change the hydrocarbon molecules to make diesel fuel and electricity. The strong, strong selling point of them was that they could take any plastic and that any carbon in the bale, so any feed or any dirt, would also create a carbon output. Um, so it was a really easy partnership to make because it was the, we could ship all the, all the bales, all the twine, all the, the end caps, everything to this end user. Their technology and expertise got delayed in Europe at the start of COVID and they got delayed so long that they ended up closing their doors before they ever opened. So we now have two other end users tentatively in place. Their or our challenge with them will be the types of plastic they take and some of our mixed bales, which will be harder to move. Um, so those are, I mean, that's a challenge that exists outside of COVID, but was compounded because of COVID. Um, and obviously that's a challenge that's outside of the scope of the project. So if, if any level of government is serious about getting a recovery model or, or program a place for any type of plastic recovery, it'll be up to them to ensure that they have some sort of place to put that plastic, either store it or recover it. Uh, at the start of the program so they can give some confidence and consistency to the farmers or other parties involved. COVID-19 also impacted the pilot specifically because this is the type of pilot that really lends itself to on the ground demonstration. So bringing a, a compactor to farm shows or having a compactor in use as part of a crop tour uh, where farmers can see how it works. We can talk about it. We can kind of show them some tips and tricks. Um, they can hear from the farmer using it. We have a couple of local champions really pushing for it. And we can be on site more consistently to make sure bales are made well. Um, COVID-19, obviously, we haven't had farm shows. We haven't had crop tours. So that has impacted how much we've pushed the pilot. Uh, as a result, we scaled back from 50 compactors to 30. And now we're doing our, this spring, we're doing kind of our first round of pickups uh, because we can finally start, hopefully, start moving around again. Within, within the Northeast. So these are our next steps as of now. So right now we're doing our bale inventory and I'll be tagging whatever bales I haven't tagged by um, April. Uh, we tag them for quality control and for traceability. So if, if bale 8250 makes it to the end user and it's full of something that shouldn't be there, we can look back to see who gave us that bale and make sure that we deal with it accordingly. Um, We'll be picking up the bales on farm uh, or on site between May and June, 2022. Uh, so this is something that obviously wouldn't be done in a larger scale program um, because it, it's not cost effective to go to every single farm. Again, normally we'd have the farmers drop off their bales uh, every couple, every twice a year to a centralized depot. But because of the scaled back pilot, we're able to pick them up on site. So that'll happen between May and June. 
And then we will bring them to a centralized location somewhere in Temiskaming. We'll split them up based on type of plastic. So the higher or the lighter density, lower density, and whether they're single stream or mixed bales. Um, and then ship them to the end users in July and August, where they will be uh, recovered into plastic composite products. And then finish up our reporting and our assessment of the overall pilot in September. So that will include, again, looking at some of those dollars and cents, best management practices, and just overall providing some feedback into what the future of plastic recovery could look like. Our main concern when we started the pilot that still exists today is that uh, some sort of producer pay models will be implemented, um, which makes a lot of sense that when you buy plastic, you pay a fee by the foot or by the roll, whatever it may be for that plastic to be recovered. And that's what funds a stewardship program. Um, our concern is that that won't take into account the challenges in the north. So farmers in the north could pay that fee and still have nowhere viable to drop off their plastic. If you have to drive a couple hundred kilometers, um, they're, they're not going to do that. Uh, but right now, when we look at some other similar models, um, that is what we see in the north, that the nearest drop off is hundreds of kilometers away. So that isn't an option for a lot of farmers to participate in. So now we're paying a fee that doesn't actually serve the, the needs of farmers in the north. And that's kind of what we're trying to uh, proactively and preemptively address with this pilot itself. So this uh, is my contact. If you have any, I'm happy to answer questions now. And if you have any further questions, you can um, hit me up. And if you're also farming in the Northeast or a Federation member in the Northeast and you ever have any issues on farm, also please reach out and we will provide whatever support and resources we can to help. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. Uh, we've got a few questions here. Um, there's a couple on uh, the possibility of recycling other kinds of agricultural plastic. Uh, one about, you know, plastic baler twine um, and one about uh, used maple maple syrup tubing. Um, yeah, are you able to speak to either of those at all? Yeah, so um, we have specifically asked about twine because we are unsure. Um, I would think the maple syrup tubing is a higher density. So um, we'll check with the the one end user in list a while. He or that business would prefer higher density plastic. They don't really want our bale wrap, likely because as you recover bale wrap, it it's already a pretty thin plastic to begin with. So there's not a lot of recovery options. Um, but higher density, so the the less malleable plastics, you have more options to recover those. So um, they may be happy to take higher density plastic. And if they are, then we will uh, you can get in touch with me directly and we can figure out a way to pick it up. Um, likely the same with twine. If we do take twine, it won't be in a bale. It'll likely just be stuffed into tote bags that will be thrown onto loads when we send them down. Um, but uh, get in touch with me privately. And then once we know, we will figure out how to pick that up if we can. Sounds good. Uh, could you put your email in the chat there in case anyone wants to get in touch I, with you? I can. Thank you. Uh, and then one, a couple other questions. Oh, yeah. So how clean does uh, the, you know, the plastic have to be? So that would depend on the end user. Uh, right now, how we've been dealing with it is we've just been asking farmers to, um, you know, when you take it off your bale, shake it out, keep it as dry as possible, because in a lot of cases, it's the moisture that poses a challenge. Um, but, you know, shake out your plastic. Uh, some people kind of put it in the corner, like they, they take off their, they, you know, let it, let it dry out, especially in the winter, let it dry out, let it thaw out, throw it in the corner as part of their dry out process and then put it in the compactor. Um, we're not washing the plastic because that's a, that's a, a barrier that we, we can't overcome. Um, but typically as long as when you look at a bale, if we, if we have to question whether it's plastic or something else, uh, that's the problem. But if you look at look at your plastic or look at your bale and it looks pretty white, um, that has been acceptable. Again, we're hoping to get better and a better idea at the end of the pilot once they start taking and recovering the bales. Um, the, and the initial end user didn't have to be clean. They would just prefer it because they make more money. Um, but the, these end users that turn it into composite products are typically, uh, they have a little more or a little less flexibility, I guess, in the cleanliness of the plastic. Um, 
the one suggestion we've had for, especially for silage wrap, so the heavier dense plastic that can get pretty gross looking, um, was just to uh, kind of tuck it into or attach it to like a fence post, let it rain once, the rain washes quite a bit off, shake it out and then put in the compactor. Um, so that seems to work well for some people. Uh, but the expectation isn't that your plastic is clean. It's just that it's not, you know, covered in chunks of feed or manure or mud, mm -hmm. which can be great. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then one other, okay, couple other questions. Um, so do you have any, uh, any data on who is recycling more, like dairy farmers or livestock, other livestock farmers or, you know, other, uh, other producers? And uh, off that, does any group of farmers need more support to recycle their plastics? Um, so we can, that's actually a good suggestion that we can look at based on who's participating. I would say the, the majority of plastics so far, apart from, uh, there's a couple horticultural guys that have been collecting plastic for a while longer, so they have a lot. Um, so yeah, the horticulture is a big sector and prop beef, I would say is another big sector. So, and I, if I look at my list of participants and the ones that are making the most bales, they're beef. Um, we did as part of our initial work on this, look at numbers like, and that's how we started the pilot. We, we looked at what's generated across the North with respect to plastic. And we did break it down in terms of the, the specific type of plastic. So whether it was bale wrap, silage, like, so based on commodities. So we do have that data from when we did that report, uh, 2018. Um, and it, it may have changed a little bit, but we do have numbers in terms of who's generating the most plastic. At this point, very few people, apart from who's in the pilot, are recovering it. Um, I don't know who would need the most support. I think generally, it might depend on what type of plastic you're producing. So bale wrap, for example, is really easy to compact. Silage bunker covers are harder because they're just, they don't, they don't make as nice of a bale. Your bale will be about 500 pounds and 900 pounds. Some egg plastics don't make sense to compact at all in a bale. So those will be trickier to move in an effective way. So that might require more, more thinking through or more support. Um, but at this point, I think we're just generally trying to keep people aware that we're going to have some challenges recovering any type of agricultural plastic in the North, any type of plastic likely at all. Uh, again, not specifically agriculture, but in any industry that produces a lot of plastic, if they're in Northern Ontario, they're going to have the same issues that we're, we're struggling with in agriculture specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, that report that breaks down the plastic is on Nofia's website uh, as part of the research projects, if you want more numbers. Um, and I guess, so another question about types of plastic, uh, would you be willing to take greenhouse cover plastic? Um, yeah, I would think that would, it's, it's in one of the two streams, either linear low density or low density. And those are the two streams that we're, we're taking to the end users. Um, so I would expect that could move just, just as well. It's just, again, if we can keep it dealt, so, so whether it's compacted or however it's stored and consolidated, if we can keep it single stream as best as possible. So it's easier for us at the end of the day to move. Um, and again, I'd say if you have plastic like that, that you want to try to get included, um, let me know with how much you have and the specific type, uh, like whatever is on say a tag, um, in your packaging, and then we can reach out to our end users to see if that can be accommodated. Great. Uh, and so what's the plan for uh, pickup? What are the opportunities for a localized pickup location for an area for farmers to bring already compacted bales to a central location? or pick up? So the farmers that are in the pilot, um, in the actual pilot, uh, we're reaching out to them this week, today, after this, this conference, uh, with some further details. We're going to be trying for um, May, June pickups. And depending on the number of bales you have, some farmers have a lot of bales, and we're just going to show up to their farm and pick up the bales. Um, if, the, if your farm can't accommodate, say, a transport or a large trailer, uh, then depending on where that area is, then we'll see where, what makes sense to, to centralize, pick it up, to pick it up centrally. Um, if that makes sense. So at this point we don't have, 
uh, partly because we rolled back the pilot, but we don't have, uh, you know, 12 established central sites for drop off based on where the bales are and who needs who needs a site that's that will depend on where we pick that site up, but we're going to be trying to get as close as possible to actual on site pickups in May and June. Great. So yeah, I guess just to recap that if there if someone is in the uh, in the trial, then you'll be getting in touch with them to deal with that. Yeah, and if you're if if you don't get an email today, um, and I missed you, or if you if you've been compacting plastic or grabbing plastic, uh, but you're not officially in the pilot, just reach out and we'll see um, what we can do. If it's plastic, the end user will take. We won't have an issue with moving it. It's making sure that they can take it and that it's it's not loose. Uh, the we can't deal with loose plastic. The end users, so there there's a little bit of a, a misconception out there that the we just ship plastic the end user and the end user takes it and crosses it right away. And that isn't what happens. The end user, at least for one of them, has specific lines that operate specific times based on the plastic he has. So he stores that plastic until he can run a line. So getting a, a bunch of loose plastic doesn't, we can't deal with it. He can't deal with it. So it has to be, if it's not compact, it still has to be, you know, in totes or somehow dealt with. So we're not sending him a bunch of, a bunch of wet, dirty pile of crap <laughs> because it doesn't look great for for the plastics program so it still has to be somehow um dealt with and that's something we can talk about specifically uh but for sure if you don't hear from us this week uh and you have plastic please feel free to reach out and we can see what we can do great thank you steph thank you